Time appropriate greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sean McBride, your graduate teaching assistant, and today I'd like to invite you to solve the parallel software crisis for fun and profit. So I'm an older software developer. I'm 35, and I can remember back in 1999, Weird Al came out with a pretty popular song, and it expressed some of the characteristics of what was happening in computer processors at the time. My new computer's got the clocks, it rocks, but it was obsolete before I opened the box. You say you've had your desktop for over a week? Throw that junk away, man. It's an antique. Your laptop is a month old? Well, that's great. If you could use a nice, heavy paperweight. Now, for recent people, uh, recent users of computers, this may be a unfamiliar uh, idea, but if we take a look at a chart charting the speed of... Um, processors from 1978 to 2018, we can see that from 1988 until about 2003, we were essentially in a golden age for computer processors, where every year a new model of a computer would come out and the processor in that uh, computer would be about 40% faster. So that means essentially every two years, you had the opportunity to buy a new machine and have essentially double the performance. Well, Take a look at what happened here in 2003. Things really slowed down uh, 2% a year. And so 1988 to 2003, every second year you could buy a computer and double your performance. Um, and 2003 to now, we pretty much haven't even doubled performance in this whole period here. So that's a, that's a big change. And the reason for that was um, some really low level material science and physics based stuff called essentially Dennard scaling. Dennard scaling was the secret sauce that ensured that processors continued to improve, get faster, get more power efficient, and that enabled that, that rapid change of 40% top line performance improvement every year. Well, when that stopped, the impact was that the semiconductor industry shift from trying to make faster processors to processors that were multi-core. And as such today, you can buy a pretty wacky things like the 64 core desktop uh, computer in kind of um, comparison, like most laptops are four or eight cores. And my gaming PC that I'm on right now is 16 cores. So this 64 core uh, beast processor is pretty, pretty out there. But it, we're not just talking about desktops. <clears throat> Multi-cores also come to mobile devices. And so in Android phones, now it's pretty common for octa-core devices. And we can see here some performance benchmarks for octa-core Android phones. And the strange thing you might notice here is, like on this LG, we go from two to four and we get a little bit of a performance boost. But when we go from four to six to eight, we get nothing. That's interesting. You'd expect you'd throw more computer cores at a problem and it should get faster. And on the Xiaomi, it's even stranger, right? We throw more cores and it actually gets slower. Why might, might that be, you might be thinking? Well, the reason for that is, among other things, Amdahl's law. Amdahl, Gene Amdahl was a computer architect and his main theoretical contribution to the field was the observation that as computers gain more and more cores, the portion of the computer program that can only is, is only able to run on a single core ends up determining the aggregate possible speed up. So for example, if 50% of your program can only run on a single core, your maximum theoretical speed up is 2x, no matter the number of cores you throw at it, right? And so that starts to explain why you can see this tapering off. And I can't say exactly what's going on with the Xiaomi, but there's some more complicated stuff going on here as well. So as a result, the free lunch is over. It used to be that you could write questionable, um, low quality computer software, and you could always count on the fact that two years from now, your computer is gonna be twice as fast, and even your kind of crummy, crappy software is gonna run faster. And so that speed up is called the free lunch, and we just don't get that anymore. The only way that we can get speed ups now is by having mastery of the computer science fundamentals, and using optimal algorithms that can that can maximize concurrency. But unfortunately, it seems like a lot of the industry is kind of moving in a different direction. And so 
if you master concurrency, I guess the, the main opportunity there is that you've got the potential to differentiate yourself and position for higher level um, salary. Uh, but right now, coding boot camps are training about 23,000 developers a year. Those students are typically career changers, and they get about three to four months of very quick training in either Python or JavaScript, and they mostly skip the computer science fundamentals to get a little bit. Um, but as a result of this, the most popular computer programming languages right now are high-level scripting languages that can really only even run on a single core. And so that means, you know, looking back on our chart here, if you can only run on a single core, right, your maximum speed up is one by Andel's law. We go back to this chart here, and that means that your maximum possible performance increase is 2% a year. In contrast, if you can write code that optimizes for making sure that your code is parallel, which requires a good, robust understanding of computer science languages and mastery of a language that enables that, you can have code that is legitimately 10 times faster. And yeah, as you can imagine, being able to write that sort of code can get you paid quite a bit better. So I hope that I've inspired you to why this is important, and I want to talk a little bit about how I want to teach this. Specifically, I want to focus on having you exposed to see a low-level language that gives you direct access to the hardware and gives you the chance to use as much uh, as, as many of the courses possible. It just really has to do with how, how good of a programmer you are. I'm going to encourage you to use the Unix reference manual, which is included with every operating system, in order to basically force you to develop a little bit of a muscle memory to know how to, as you code, refer to the reference documentation, which is what real software engineers do in real life. We're going to do um, group collaboration using the remote collaboration features offered by Visual Studio Code, the most popular coding editor right now. And we're going to use a jigsaw approach, which I think is the most interesting part here. And that jigsaw approach forces everyone that you're going to team up with to be responsible for a little bit of the solution. And I think that's very important for computer science because generally when I've seen group work, often there's a tendency where one or two alpha geeks can kind of dominate everything and the rest of the folks sort of write off the coattails. And we don't want that. We want everyone to feel really comfortable writing concurrent software and to get really, really good with this stuff to be able to encourage your earning prospects and all of that. So by doing this jigsaw approach, we're actually going to assume a particular role, sort of like an RPG group, which is why I have this image here. So it was, you know, elves, orcs, warriors, barbarians, wizards, or whatever, they all have different capabilities and your RPG party groups together, and then you can accomplish great things. And so here for this lab guide, we have different roles, architect, threadripper, locksmith, key master, and different responsibilities um, for those areas. And that ensures that everyone is basically going to ha have to become, achieve some sort of mastery for these different programming interfaces. You're going to cross teach each other you're going to field questions from each other, and then you're going to apply this in a project setting. And generally, the pedagogical research and software industry research really bears this out. So, for example, a 22 or a 2012 National Research Council report generally found that student-centered approaches such as Jigsaw encourage active learning, uh, provides more frequent assessment of your conceptual understanding, and encourages metacognitive strategies and what that all kind of comes together to is you get a little bit of the kind of magic sauce that I get as a GTA, where when you are constantly being asked about your subject matter, it is turns out to be a powerful motivator of understanding exactly where your level of mastery is with the material. And I want each of you to have a little bit of that feedback from your peers um, and be comfortable teaching each other materials because going forward, when you're outside of an educational setting, and working in a group, you're going to be doing a lot of what's called pair programming, which is essentially group work in groups of two. And in those groups of two, um, it's going to work more or less just like we do in this lab. And I, I want to read just kind of a quote from this costs and benefits of pair programming, which il illustrates some of the advantages of doing, doing group work while doing programming. There were times when I we felt that we would have given up except we tag teamed. I'd be on the ropes and I'd describe the problem in such a way that he had a valuable insight. Then he'd fight on as long as he could and then stop. Then I'd have an insight and so on. I suppose others would call it brainstorming, but it feels different to me. So programming can be pretty frustrating. Sometimes you're just kind of mentally exhausted and out of energy. 
And at when at those kind of lulls in your your mental energy, that's often when the partner can kind of come in and help fill in the gap. And so, um, oftentimes, pair programming you just stay in kind of the programming flow a little bit longer. And the whole time that you're doing that, you're you're engaging in active learning, explaining your thought processes and why you're coding the way you're coding. Um, usually, the person that is not active on the keyboard is referring to the reference materials and teaching. Um, doing like on-demand teaching based on based on what you're what you're working on so all this stuff kind of comes together uh the, the educational research bears it out it's very useful in the programming industry i think you're gonna have a great um great fit for this lab so i hope i hope you sign up for my my lab and you choose to solve the the parallel software crisis for fun and profit thank you have a great day